Good morning. It's always a little awkward. It's like, uh, do I clap? It's weird to clap for a pastor, but someone else is clapping. I don't want him to think he don't, I don't like me, him because then he'll stare at me during the sermon and make me feel guilty. Um, I had something I wanted to say, a couple things I wanted to say. Uh, so the, uh, the new location Richard mentioned is actually in Trinidad, in the heart of the Trinidad neighborhood. Um, we are in the process of, um, it's owned by Catholic, the Catholic Church, and we're in the process of working with the Archdiocese to see if it can become our permanent location in Northeast D.C. It's a phenomenal space. Um, so if you live over in Northeast um, or over near that location, um, and you can get yourself up at 10 a.m. in the morning, I'd encourage you to, to join us um, uh, in Trinidad. Uh, the other thing is, uh, if you go to thetablechurch.org forward slash Easter, um, you can find um, a bunch of, I guess, shareables is the right word. Um, Easter is a time, I've talked about this before, Easter is a time when your friends and family who may be closed off to church um, are a bit more receptive. Um, and um, one of the things that I think has is, is impacted me more than almost anything else about being the pastor of the table is when people come and tell me things like, I just want to tell you what I found at the table. Um, people say, you know, I found joy, or I found home, or I found acceptance. And so we've made shareables that you can share on social media um, and a number of other ways just to kind of invite your friends and family and talk about what you found. Um, one of them says, I found belonging. Another one says, I found joy. Another one says, I found home. And these are actually all statements that we received when we did a survey asking people what they found at the table. And so if one of those resonates with you, I'd really encourage you to share that um, some way this week uh, and invite some friends and family to join you on Easter Sunday. Easter at the table is always a giant party um, that you don't want to miss. This morning, um, I woke up to a text from a friend who's a bit dramatic. Um, but it said this, this is the first text I received early this morning as I was drinking my coffee, more dead. And then he texted the next one that came through, why do I even get up? And then the next one said, Hosanna, which I thought was an appropriate way to start Palm Sunday. We'll talk in a minute, but Hosanna is, is literally a cry for desperation that says, save us, help us. Today we're going to talk about the most controversial topic in the history of the table. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk, I want to tell us a story. I want to talk a bit about Palm Sunday. On Sunday, or thereabouts before Jesus dies, Jesus and his disciples head into Jerusalem. And I wanted you to kind of get a sense of what this journey looks like. So Jesus and his disciples head into Jerusalem, and I couldn't get my my red marker to work um, on the screen or when I was making the slides, but if, do we have the map? I think we have a map. Um, Jesus and his disciples were heading in from Jericho. Do you see Jericho? It's about the middle of the screen, right underneath Ephraim. Ephraim. Jesus and his disciples are heading into Jerusalem. And then up the top, you'll see Caesarea. I'll talk about that in a minute. I kind of wanted you to get a sense of what this area of the world looks like. So Jesus and his disciples are heading into Jerusalem from Jericho. Um, and they are headed there for the Passover. They're headed from the east. And at the exact same time that Jesus, the son of God, is heading into Jerusalem from the east, at the same time, Pilate, who is the representative of another son of God, Caesar Augustus, is headed in from the west from a town called Caesarea. Caesarea best we can tell is essentially a lavish resort town, um, in, which is in a lot of ways a monument to Caesar. And, and both are headed in, one from the west, one from the east, at the same time into Jerusalem to celebrate the season of Passover or the Passover week. But I don't think we often understand the gravity of what this week represents and what Jerusalem was like on this week. Passover is a time when Israel was remembered, when Israel remembers that God miraculously liberated them from oppression. It's a night when Israel remembers their salvation from the Egyptian powers, or a week when they remember their salvation from the Egyptian powers. And the celebration of Passover always had undertones of rescue and liberation. 
And so if you are, an, an, a, if you are a, a power that has colonized a people, any time that they gather to celebrate a night to remember a miraculous liberation, you want to be on high alert. Not to mention, and this is the other thing I think that we sometimes overlook, that not to mention that the time that Jesus walked the earth, it was the most volatile time in Israel's history. Before Jesus arrives and after Jesus arrives, other messiahs show up claiming to be the one that they've been waiting for. And what ends up happening on both sides is there are violent uprisings. In fact, one of the things you'll notice as you read through the New Testament is that Jesus weeps over Jerusalem. And partly what he's weeping over is he knows the eventual path that they're on, that their history, if they continue the road that they're on, that they will no longer exist. In fact, 35 years, we forget this, 35 years after Jesus dies or thereabouts in 70 AD, Jerusalem is essentially wiped off the map. It's the bloodiest battle in all of Israel's history. In fact, historians tell us that it was so bloody that blood ran down the the temple steps like a river. Jesus understands what understands that there is this there is this volatility it, 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 there's this volatility in, at this time in Israel's history because Israel is upset that they're occupied by the Roman powers and they are constantly looking and hoping and waiting and expecting a Messiah to show up and to liberate them. They're looking for a Messiah who will take them back to the reign of King David, the good old days when they were the world's superpower. In fact, if you'll notice, even in the, the Palm Sunday text, that if you go and read the different Gospels, they'll talk about the reign of King David. So Passover took the unusual or the usual political and social tensions and put them on high alert. If Israel was a powder keg, Passover always risked lighting the fuse. Because the town of Jerusalem, during Passover, the town of Jerusalem, which held about 40,000 people on a on an average week, swelled to 250,000 people. So you can imagine if you were Pilate and the Roman authorities, here is a group of people who are celebrating their rescue from a, an oppressive power, and they view you as an oppressive power, and their population of this city is going to go from 40,000 to 250,000, and they're probably going to drink a bit too much wine at the same time. It is a potential powder cake or potential explosive atmosphere. And so what would happen every year is that Pilate would march into Jerusalem. He would leave his cushy home on this, the sea, and he would march into Jerusalem to try to keep law and order. And there was always a big mess to clean up, fights to break up, and people to govern. And so what Pilate would do is he would come in, he would march into town with with, a, with a, an overwhelming show of force. He would march into town and there would be these processions designed to show authority and to show his power. It was designed to scare people that they should not even think of rising up against the Roman authorities. And the procession would always begin with the Roman emblem, which was an eagle. And this is the best I could find to show you what it looks like is some guys playing dress up. Um, if you notice, there are people like in the side in jeans watching. Um, but this is actually about as close, right? They would come in, but it was actually much more ominous than 30 guys hanging out um, playing dress up. But it would always be led by the Roman eagle. And then there'd be all these um, signs and symbols that they would hold representing the power of Rome. And they would have shields and there would be giant horses and they would march in with overwhelming force. Now just a side note, notice the eagle. The eagle always led Roman procession. So then when you hear Jesus say, that, when Jesus says something like this, the foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What he's referring to, it, he, it's an analogy. They referred to Herod, who was they saw as an illegitimate leader. They referred to Herod as the fox. And they referred to Rome, Rome was the bird, the eagle. And so when Jesus says uh, the birds have, uh, the foxes ha and have holes and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, he's speaking about Rome as the bird and Herod as the fox. And, he, and Jesus is saying, these other movements are about power, but mine is different. I don't even have a place to sleep. These are the things we kind of miss when we kind of gloss over these texts. Behind this eagle and this procession would have been Roman soldiers carrying 
um, all these emblems to remind people of the power of Rome, to remind them of Rome's dominating force. And everything about this procession was meant to show power and might and strike hearts or strike fear into the hearts of any would-be revolutionary. At the same time that Pilate is emerging from the west, Jesus is coming from the east on a donkey. Actually, a stolen donkey, but that's another story. (laughs) Such a weird, like, thing. Go go take the donkey, and if they want to know why you're stealing it, tell them the Lord needs it, and we'll bring it right back quickly. We read in Mark 11, beginning with verse 8, Many people spread their cloaks on the road. And others spread leafy branches that they'd cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, as I said, is simply a transliteration of the Hebrew imperative, um, Hosa, which, it, it, which is a, it's a transliteration that just essentially means help us, save us. And then Anna at the end is, is, a, is a suffix that it shows urgency. Save us now. We are desperate. It's a cry of desperation. Blessed is the coming king. Blessed is the coming kingdom. Notice this. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. It's, it's, It's a longing for the way that things used to be back when they were powerful. Hosanna, save us, help us now. Like seriously, we're desperate. So just a quick recap of what's happened so far, that Jesus and Pilate are both headed for Jerusalem during Passover, approaching from different sides of the city, one in peace, one in power. Pilate with all the might of Rome at his disposal and Jesus with his stolen donkey. And Israel is unhappy with the oppression of the Romans and they want to be free. And so as Jesus approaches Jerusalem at this holiday where they celebrate a miraculous Um, miraculous uh, liberation. People are excited. Maybe this guy will enact this salvation that we've been longing for. And so the stage has been set. The crowd is waiting expectantly. Something, something is about to go down. Now let's talk about food. One of the things we learn about Jesus as you start reading the Bible, especially the Gospels, is that Jesus eats, like, all the time. I mean, all the time. In fact, one scholar, Robert Karras, said that in Luke's Gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. This is why he walks so much, is to keep his weight under control. Little known fact of the Bible. I mean, literally, go back, read through the gospel stories, and notice how many of these stories take place somehow related to a meal. The dude is always eating. In fact, Jesus spent so much time eating food and drinking wine that his enemies called him a glutton. His enemies called him a glutton and a drunkard. Now, maybe Jesus just liked food and liked to party. I actually think he did. But something else was also going on here, because in the ancient Near Eastern world, meals were a sign of friendship and acceptance and grace. Meals around the time of Christ were full of significance. I mean, meals today are still full of significance. If you, were to, if you come to the, uh, a newcomer's brunch at the table and our director of engagement, Ashley Close, is there, chances are she'll ask you this question as an, as an icebreaker. Tell me about your most memorable meal. And there's the stories that people share are phenomenal. There's a professor of New Testament theology, a guy named Scott um, Barchi, uh, who says this. He said, it would be difficult to overestimate the importance of table fellowship for the cultures of the Mediterranean basin in the first century of our era. Meal times were far more than an occasion for individuals to consume nourishment. Being welcomed at a table for the purposes of eating with another person had become a ceremony richly symbolic of friendship and intimacy and unity. He continues on. Thus, betrayal or unfaithfulness towards anyone with whom one had shared a table was viewed as particularly reprehensible. On the other hand, when persons were estranged, a meal invitation opened the way 
to reconciliation. Then, as now, meals are a powerful moment for reconciliation, but meals also have the power of segregating. Our own nation has a history of segregating people around meals. Think of the lunch counters in the American South. In Jesus' day, and this is really key to understand, in Jesus' day, good religious people had built fences around the table had built walls around the table as a way to protect themselves from defilement. So there is this group of people, you've got a number of groups of people who are all longing for God's kingdom to be restored, longing for the kingdom of David to be restored, longing for the good old days to be restored. So everyone is waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, which is laced all throughout Jesus' teachings. And there's one group of people who think that the kingdom of God is going to come through a violent revolt. They're, named, they're called the zealots. And then there's another group of people known as the Pharisees. If you've grown up around church, you've heard the word the Pharisees. They're not fair, you see. Um, and there, so you've got the Pharisees. And um, the Pharisees believe that God's kingdom would be restored by Israel being extra holy by being extra moral. Because if they read their, they've read the stories and they've realized that their downfall comes because of their immorality, or that's how they read the story. And so they believe that if they kept, if they became pure enough, if they became pure enough, then they could restore the kingdom of God or the kingdom of David. And so they had created all these rules. The Pharisees had 600 plus rules to keep themselves pure. And what, some of the rules that they had dealt with the idea of table fellowship and, and, and keeping yourself clean, uh, ritually, ritually pure, was key to being a good Jew, at least the Pharisees believed. And, and, and so you wanted to avoid anything and anyone who could contaminate you. And one of the surest ways to contaminate yourself was to eat a dinner with the wrong type of person. Because if you were to dip your hand into the hummus and they were to dip their hand into the hummus, somehow their uncleanliness could be transferred to you. In fact, if you were to eat with someone who was unclean, you had to become ritually pure afterwards. This is the backdrop of all the times that Jesus ate with people around tables. But the problem is, is that Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners and the poor and those who didn't quite measure up with how God's salvation was going to come. In fact, Jesus shared his table with people who they had segregated themselves from and who they had marginalized. And Jesus shows up, we're told, Jesus shows up and he comes also proclaiming the kingdom of God. The zealots And the Pharisees and Jesus were all proclaiming the same thing, that this is how the kingdom of God spreads. This is how the kingdom of God comes. But Jesus shows up and he says this, look, he said, the Son of Man came came for these people that you're excluding. He came to seek and save the lost. Luke says, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking. And if you read the Gospels, if you read the Gospels, the method that Jesus goes about spreading salvation often happened around the shared meal. It happened around the table. And Jesus would extend grace to those that no one else would extend grace to. And Jesus, listen, Jesus makes God known through table fellowship, through a meal, through a simple meal where he extended grace to people. And if you're new to faith or you're new to the church or you're coming back and you were to say, hey, can you show me one picture? Can you show me one picture of what it looks like to follow Jesus? I want one picture. It's a meal. It's table fellowship. And so what does Jesus do? The final night before he's betrayed, Sunday morning, he rolls into town. Jesus coming from the 
the east, Herod from, or Pilate from the west. On Thursday night, what does Jesus do? He invites his disciples to share a meal. He invites his disciples to share a meal. Now, Jesus invites his disciples to share a meal, but before that, before the meal, there's this week, these few days that happen, and there's actually a quite a, there's a significant amount of scripture dedicated to these few days between like Sunday and Thursday. And in fact, on Monday morning or thereabouts, I, I don't think we know the exact date, Jesus actually does a few things that make him seem as if he's going to be the revolutionary that they've all expected. You know, he bursts in the temple and overturns tables and causes havoc, and people have to be saying, it is going down, like some stuff is about to happen. But then, over the next few days, Jesus starts just babbling on about the end, about his last days. Some of it's apocalyptic text and literature that no one really even fully understands what Jesus means. He preaches a little and talks in odd riddles. Particularly, he talks about the temple being destroyed. In fact, there's even a moment where Jesus gets a bit weepy as he looks out on Jerusalem. But there's no big movement. And then, less than a week after he enters the city as the conquering hero, Jesus sits down to a meal with his disciples. And the meal in Mark's gospel is bookended with two events. On the one end, it's Judas betraying Jesus, agreeing to sell Jesus out. And on the other end, immediately bookending, on the other end of the meal is Jesus telling his own disciples that they are going to betray him. And yet, in spite of the disciples' failures and shortcomings, which Jesus is only too aware, he invites them to share a meal. To share a moment of intimacy, a moment of acceptance, a moment of grace. We read, While they were eating, he took a loaf of bread, and after blessing it, He broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, Take, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and and all of them drank from it. And he said to them as they drank it, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never drink again of the fruit of the vine." Until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This table that Jesus shares with his disciples, this table, this moment becomes central to the Christian story. It's the table that we will gather around in a few minutes and we will reproclaim those words that Jesus said thousands of years before. Jesus invited his broken and flawed disciples who he knew would betray him. He invites them to join him at this meal. And Jesus invites you, in spite of your brokenness, to join him at this table. The week began with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem and this question, how would the kingdom of God spread? Will it come the way of Pilate and the Romans, their might and their power? Will it come the way of the zealots through violent overthrow, or will it come the way of the Pharisees through exclusion? And Jesus answers the question this way. He said the kingdom of God spreads through love, through sacrifice, through giving of ourself. The kingdom of God spreads through table fellowship. In fact, John's gospel actually builds on this narrative in a way the other gospels don't and talks about Jesus taking taking off his outer garment and kneeling and beginning to wash the disciples' feet and then saying, do as I have done. Jesus says the kingdom of God spreads through table fellowship. It, It comes by Jesus inviting unlikely characters to God's table. The Pharisees believed, this is what's so amazing about Jesus, is that the Pharisees believed that by sharing a meal with someone, you risk defilement. 
Did Jesus believe that by sharing a meal with someone that his holiness becomes contagious and not defiled? People are made holy as they share a meal with Jesus. Now the most controversial thing about our church. When we started the table, we began by reading stories about Jesus around the table. It seemed an appropriate way to begin a church called The Table. And you learn an awful lot about Jesus by the watching who he shares a meal with. We learn that Jesus shared a meal with people that no one else would share a meal with. It gets so bad at one point that the disciples who seem to go between revulsion and concern with Jesus, they pull his, the Pharisees pull his disciples aside and say, like, what the crap is Jesus doing? Does he not realize who he's eating a meal with? Maybe you should tell him. Jesus spent his entire ministry sharing the table with all sorts of people, particularly flawed and broken people, rich people and poor people, holy and unholy, honest and dishonest, those who doubted and those who had faith, deserving and undeserving. And so as a church, we decided how could we do any less how could we not invite everyone to God's table? Because through the table, listen, through the table, Jesus brings people together. And so through the table, we believe, we hope to bring people together. We hope to reconcile people both with God and with each other. And coming to this table not only reminds us that we are invited as guests to God's table, but it also reminds us that we are given the freedom to invite others to be guests as well. Aaron Nequa says, the invitation of Christ is not simply to be tolerated as we are, but to be swept up into God's ongoing work of redemption. The invitation of Christ is not to become arbiters of who's in and who's out, but to be swept up into God's ongoing work of redemption. And so as a church, we decided that we would practice an open table, that we would welcome everyone to the table. The only thing that we required is that they saw themselves in need of God's grace. Now, this, this actually, for my tradition, is not that weird. But this turned out to be the most controversial thing about the table. In fact, we had one couple that went here, or one of the... Uh, one, uh, uh, part of the couple went here, and they almost broke up. His girlfriend set him down and said, I'm thinking about breaking up with you. And when he asked, what, what is it? And she's like, it's the church that you go to. And he's like, well, what is it about the church that I go to that would cause you to break up with me? And, and she said, it's not even the fact that the church that the church exists. It's more that you would go to this church that shares an open table, and I'm not sure what that says about you. It t still to this day takes me by surprise that the thing I get more emails about and more comments about is how dare you invite everyone to God's table, right? Because the church has a bit of a Pharisaic streak within it where we also put walls around God's table, something that Jesus never does. And then what we do is we take Paul's words in the New Testament and we twist them to make them say something that Paul never meant them to say to support our exclusion of people at God's table. But Jesus, but Jesus was never about preparing a meal for the holy. But he prepared a meal for everyone. Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, the head of the Anglican Communion, said it this way, We take communion not because we are doing well, but because we are doing bad. As we approach this table, we believe that the gospel story is played out in our midst, and we are invited into a much larger story of brokenness and healing, sin and redemption, and ultimately of the overwhelming and irresistible love of God. The story of Abraham becomes our story. The story of Israel becomes our story. The story of Jesus' incredible victory and redemption on the cross, it becomes our story, and we reenact this story every week. And so we, as we prepare in a moment to approach this meal and invite God's grace into our lives, we are saying yes to the way of Jesus. We are inviting Jesus to begin to transform us into people who follow the way of Jesus. 
Herod, or Pilate rather, comes from the west with might and power. And Jesus enters from the east on a donkey. And his, his week ends in sharing a meal. My friend's text continues to rumble around in my head that says, more are dead. See, I think each and every one of us have a decision. We can either respond to violence and brokenness in our world through the way of Pilate. And when I saw the Syrian children this week, cradled, a nine-month-old cradled in her father's arm as the father of a nine-month-old, I wanted to rain down terror. I still want to rain down terror on anyone who would do that. And I'm not actually, uh, I am not a pacifist, and we can have a conversation about how the military should respond to stuff like that. But as Christians, as followers of Jesus, in a world that is broken and divided, we have a response. Do we respond in the way of Pilate with might and power, or do we respond in the way of Jesus, which goes about the process of healing and reconciliation through sharing a table? See, this table that we gather around each and every week, we are invited to be united with God and you be united with one another. But, but the, the table fellowship that begins here should not end here. And this actually is not written in my sermon. It's just, in, so if you're like, this does not make logical sense. I don't know where you're going. This is just me going off. The table fellowship that begins here needs to extend into your week. For too long, we have segregated and divided ourselves. We share table fellowship only with people who look a lot like us. Think about who you've had a meal with or who you've shared drinks with in the past week. And we live in a world of incredible brokenness, and we are so good at dividing ourselves with moral and righteous indignation. Can you believe that they support that? Can you believe that they're, you know, you fill in the blank. In a world where we are so broken, the way that healing and reconciliation begins to creep into our very midst, the way that God's kingdom spreads, remember it begins as a mustard seed. Mustard seeds simply become these plants that are obnoxious and get into everything as they grow. The way the kingdom of God spreads is through table fellowship. And so my challenge this morning is I invite you to God's table. I invite you to a table of grace and healing and acceptance and reconciliation. I encourage you to not allow it to end here. But that you allow the, 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 if you allow the example of Jesus to seep into your own table fellowship practices. And you ask yourself, who am I sharing a meal with? Because healing and reconciliation and grace are extended through a table. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this table that you invite us to every single week. It's not our table, it is your table. I pray that today, especially, you would meet us here, that your spirit would meet us in a special way as we come forward and as we eat the bread and we drink the wine as we invite your grace into our lives, I pray that you would begin to transform us to be people who look like you. I pray that your holiness would be contagious. But I pray that it would not end here, but that you would encourage us and empower us to begin sharing and opening our own tables with people who look different and act different and believe different than we do you would continue your work of healing and restoration through the sharing of bread and the drinking of wine. Amen.